good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of eStewards version 4.0. Today we will be covering an overview of the changes found in version 4.0 compared to the previous version of eStewards, which was version 3.1. My name is Austin Matthews. I am the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I have a brief agenda on the screen. For today's webinar, we will begin with a little bit of information about PJR, who we are, what we do. We'll cover some general benefits to certification to give you an idea of the drivers behind pursuing eStewards specifically. We will cover relevant transition information for clients who are already certified to eStewards and will be transitioning to version four in the coming uh, months or year or so. After that, we will provide a overview of the higher level key changes within the standard, again, compared to version 3.1. Then, as time allows, we'll get into a little bit more detail looking at an overview of the standard um, clause by clause. We will close the presentation with an overview of the certification process for anyone who is not currently eStewards certified and would be pursuing certification for the first time, um, give folks an ex uh, some expectations of what that process looks like. Um, if they're not already familiar with that process. I will be saving questions for the end, so feel free to type your questions into the question uh, field at any point throughout the presentation, and we'll make time for that at the end of the presentation. Today's uh, slides, as well as a recording of the webinar, will be made available on PGR's website sometime after the presentation. We put our recordings on YouTube and you can find links to the YouTube page um, and relevant recordings on PGR's website as well. So just a little bit about Perry Johnson Registrars. We are a leading registrar. Uh, we have certified companies and clients to a variety of standards around the world. This is not an all-inclusive list, but gives you an idea of our global presence. And we are accredited to grant certifications, again, for a variety of standards. I'm not sure that this is even an all-inclusive list, but it certainly gives you an idea of the breadth of coverage we offer. We are certified, we are accredited to certify clients to eStewards. Currently, we are accredited to version 3.1, and of course, we will be pursuing accreditation to version 4.0. Specific to eStewards, some benefits and drivers associated with certification include a commitment to prevention of irresponsible or illegal handling of hazardous waste or e-waste streams, data security and protection, social responsibility, and environmental protection and conservation. Those are kind of the pillars of eStewards uh, certification, what represents the stewardship uh, concept. Another benefit is the reduction of environmental, occupational health and safety, data security, and social accountability risks. There are business management drivers, including improvements to public image by maintaining a certification that boasts uh, these topics and these uh, reductions in risk. Advertising of responsible management of electronics and associated electronic components. In addition to improved public image and the ability to advertise the responsible management, there could be other competitive advantage um, gleaned from holding this certification. If your competitors don't hold a steward certification, that may offer a competitive advantage, for example in industries where the eStewards name has significant value. The standard also provides a framework for maintaining compliance with customer and or regulatory requirements, including the Basel Convention. 
So a little bit about eStewards version 4.0. The revised standard was published in February of this year. Um, you can access the standard online. Um, obviously, the slide is not hyperlinked for uh, your purposes, but um, you can always uh, type that in or, or find it online. So the eStewards website has the standard available uh, as well as a copy of the guidance document. The, this version of eStewards is actually free. Uh, you no longer have to purchase the standard and it doesn't require an end user agreement. So one of the main changes in eStewards version 4.0 is the removal of all the ISO 14001 language. So that proprietary language has been removed, which is why the uh, version 4.0 is free and doesn't require a user agreement. It's also much so shorter because that language has been removed. eStewards has published their transition plan as well for clients transitioning from version 3.1 to version 4.0 of eStewards. So the overall deadline to transition is August 24th, 2021. So technically there was about 18 months, doesn't really feel like that with all of the uh, coronavirus situation going on. Um, and the fact that you have to start transitioning this year. So all audits scheduled to begin on or after August 24th of 2020 need to be conducted against version 4.0. So what that means is you will be audited to version 4.0 if your next audit is scheduled to take place on or after August 24th of this year. If you are found in full conformance of version four, then you will be issued a revised certificate uh, once that audit package is complete to version four. And in the interim, as long as you're still meeting the requirements of 3.1, your certification status to 3.1 will not be negatively impacted. So if you have some findings, if you're not uh, fully approved right off the bat to go to 4.0, you would still maintain that version 3.1. And as long as you are maintaining conformance, you will keep that version 3.1 uh, until the overall deadline to transition. So ideally, everything would go smoothly. You will take this webinar, start getting an idea of what has changed with the standard and start making those relevant changes to your system to be ready to transition at your regularly scheduled audit on or after August 24th. And ideally, again, um, even if you've got some nonconformities to work through, you would be recommended for version four after those nonconformities are closed, and we would issue you a revised certificate. Otherwise, you have until August 24th of 2021 when your version 3.1 certificate will be withdrawn. We could talk more about that as we move through the presentation. So, in response to eStewards transition plan, PGR has issued their own. We have posted it on our website, and we have emailed each of our current, um, currently certified PGR um, eStewards clients. One of the things you will find in the transition plan is a recommendation to transition by June 1st of 2021. What this means is if your audit is for 2020 occurring before the August 24th deadline, then your 2021 audit might be say late June or sometime in July or even early August, but again, ahead of that August 24th for 2020, that might not give you enough time before that August 24th, 2021 deadline. If you have not transitioned by then, if you do not have a version 4.0 certificate in your hand by that uh, August 24th, 2021 date, you will lose your eSteward certification. It will be withdrawn. You will not be certified. You'll have a lapse in certification. In order to avoid that, if your audit is set to take place next year, 
late June, um, July, like I said, even early August, and you haven't, you don't transition in 2020, we would recommend moving your audit up um, to accommodate a deadline of June 1st, 2021, so that we can guarantee no lapse in certification. And what we're referring to here is all of the activities that take place after your audit ends. If there are nonconformities, you need time to collect and implement sufficient corrective actions. Those corrective action plans need to be approved by your auditor. Then the package goes through an internal certification review process uh, within PJR. And then the certificate itself, itself needs to go through a review process before it is issued to you. So again, all of these activities take time. It's not enough to have your audit by that August 24th, 2021 deadline. All of the certification decision-making activities need to be complete and a certificate issued to you uh, by that date to not have a lapse. These transition audits can take place uh, during either a surveillance or a research, it does not uh, necessarily have to be a recertification audit uh, for you to transition. So you would be transitioning during your regularly scheduled audit, like I said, um, after August 24th, 2020, um, and before August 24th, 2021. PJR reserves the right to add audit time to a surveillance audit in order to adequately cover all transition requirements. This decision has not been made yet. I wanted to keep this verbiage open-ended. In some cases, um, the accreditation bodies like ANAB will specify that the certification bodies need to add time. This has not been communicated yet. So until they take a position on eSteward specifically for this transition to 4.0, I can't say for sure whether time will be added or not. Uh, PJR is uh, preparing all the necessary steps and uh, documentation changes on our end, and we will be ready to conduct audits to version 4.0 by August 24th of 2020. I put all of that same information onto a timeline. Sometimes the visual representation is helpful. Um, it contains all of the same information we have already gone through. Um, version four being published in February of this year. Our auditors have already been trained um, to version 4.0. Starting August 24th, all audits need to be conducted to version 4.0 instead of 3.1. Our internal deadline or recommendation would be June 1st of 2021. If you haven't already transitioned or had your audit, um, keep that in mind as you're scheduling your audits for next year. The overall deadline to transition is August 24th, 2021. And again, that is the certificate being issued by that date to prevent a lapse. And as we will speak more about uh, later in the presentation, there is also a requirement in East Stewards version 4.0 to obtain NAID AAA data security certification by July 1st of 2022. So I added that to the timeline, um, again, to continue with that visual representation of everything related to version 4.0. And we can discuss this uh, later in the presentation. So at a high level, I have a couple slides of the key changes in version 4.0, some of which we will discuss in more detail as we move through the slides. I mentioned already that the standard is shorter due to the removal of the ISO 14001 verbiage and can be obtained for free. Um, the shorter, less prescriptive nature of this standard hopefully makes it easier to understand. Um, while it is less prescriptive and provides more flexibility for organizations to determine how they want to implement the changes on their own, uh, the standard does still retain rigor in the most important areas, uh, such as controls for human health, exports, and security of data. Version 4.0 incorporates new Basel Convention trade rules and recent amendments. With the removal of the ISO 14001, verbiage, it does now require a separate ISO, ISO 14001 certification. So that's an important change um, as far as 
audit time is concerned, especially, no longer will you get a certificate that reflects both standards. You will have two separate certificates. The audits can be conducted concurrently, um, and there may be some discounts we can apply for integration if the systems are um, integrated, but the audit time will need to be calculated separately. That is specified within Appendix C of the standard. Um, those audit time calculations are required to be utilized by certification bodies like PJR. So the audit time is not something that we as a registrar create on our own. We're required to follow Appendix C and the referenced um, time requirements within there. So with 14001 and eStewards being uh, calculated separately, you can expect an increase in audit time overall. Again, as I mentioned, version 4.0 requires NAID AAA certification by July 1st of 2022 to meet the data security requirements within the standard. It was noted during our auditor training with eStewards that they negotiated reduced fees uh, with need for East Steward certified organizations. I don't have more detail than that, but I thought that that was worth noting um, in case anyone pursues need AAA certification prior to um, this deadline. A guidance document has been created for version 4.0, and again, that can be found online. It contains some examples and how to's and things like that. It will be a living document that they update as needed. Um, again, that was covered in our auditor training, so they will utilize um, that as a living document. There are multiple changes to the definitions, and overall, there are more definitions um, than in version 3.1. Some examples include MOCs, tolling operations, uh, the precautionary principle, uh, QSCs, um, we will discuss the definitions in more detail, but I did want to note that HEW replaces HEE, and that represents a subset of MOCs. So we can uh, keep that in mind when we look more closely at the definitions. Version 4.0 includes extended producer requirements. It has relaxed inventory requirements for QSCs, such as the ability to put them in lots. Version 4.0 allows but regulates tolling operations. There are some additions to noise monitoring. In some cases, annual sampling requirements have been reduced. Um, there are some changes to the battery testing criteria. On-site downstream audits have been decreased to every three years instead of every two years in some instances. There are additional requirements for closure plan, financial instrument, and insurance checks. And the appendices have also been revised on a variety of subjects. Okay, so we'll spend the bulk of the time today looking at the standard itself. Um, obviously, you should obtain a copy of the standard for yourself. It is free. You can get uh, quite a bit more detail in the standard itself than I'm able to go into today. Um, this is just a high-level informational webinar, not a formal training. So again, uh, the ISO 14001 verbiage has been removed, and that includes specific terms and definitions, which can now be found in ISO 14001. Those do apply unless they're superseded superseded, excuse me, by an East Stewards definition specifically. I'm not going to read through the definitions or even all of the terms, but on these slides, I did include to draw your attention to uh, the terms that have been revised between version 3.1 and version 4.0. You can see there are several. And again, these slides will be made available for your uh, review after the webinar. There are also a number of new definitions. So these are not revised terms, but new terms. As I mentioned, materials of concern, MOCs, qualified smaller components, QSCs, 
Stewardship Management System, SMS, replaces the concept of the EHSMS to extend to EHS and those additional stewardship items, data security, social accountability, things like that. There are even a couple terms that are removed. As I mentioned, hazardous electronic equipment has been replaced by EGW. Some of these are still covered, but the terms are a little bit different, so they are um, revised or new. Definitely take a close look at those terms uh, on your own time as you prepare to transition. Clause four uh, covers context 4.1, specifically the stewardship management system. This section specifies things to be included in the documented scope and includes a list of items or concepts to be considered, such as the precautionary principle, um, adherence to the waste management hierarchy wherever possible, um, transparency throughout the recycling chain, concepts like that. They are specified in 4.1. They are not required to be included in the scope, but considered within the scope. Clause 5 focuses on leadership. 5.1 has been shortened, um, again, with the removal of the ISO 14001 language and the standard being overall uh, less prescriptive in nature. You'll see several of these sections have been shortened. Um, in this case, there are no significant changes to the intent in 5.1. 5.2, stewardship policy. Again, this has been shortened. You see uh, stewardship swapping out some of the other terms we might have seen in 3.1. And again, it specifies things to be included um, within the, the documented stewardship policy. Some of those items include protection from harassment or discrimination, uh, restrictions around transboundary movements and disposal of MOCs, manage, uh, materials of concern, um, prison operation restrictions, things like that. So regarding the policy, you would refer to 5.2 to identify what the standard requires be included. 5.3 covers organizational roles, responsibilities, and authority. Again, shortened to pull out 14,001. By requiring your system to have a separate ISO 14,001 certificate, those requirements are not going away. They're just being pulled out of the e-steward standard itself. So it's, it's inferred or implied that in addition to the requirements in eStewards 4.0, you'll also be meeting the requirements of 14,001. So it's redundant to list them in both places. So this section is shortened, requires uh, the establishment of teams for implementing and improving the uh, stewardship management system, including a safety team, which is to include representation from all levels of the organization. So you can take a look at 5.3 for more information on those teams. Section six covers planning, 6.1 actions to address risks and opportunities. The section requires the organization to plan and document tasks for addressing and monitoring risks and opportunities. Nothing earth shattering there. 6.1.1 focuses on risk assessment. There are no changes to the frequency or the scope of assessment. It's still initially and at least every three calendar years, as well as in response to significant changes. This applies to all operations under its control, including ancillary sites. So those aren't different. Um, those are not changes between 3.1 and 4.0, but uh, worth uh, refreshing your memory. 6.1.1 specifies uh, items to be included or count as inputs for the risk assessment. This now includes uh, PHPTs utilized for uh, electronic equipment processing and other hazardous substances present. 6.1.1 does not specify the qualifications needed to conduct the risk assessment. 6.1.2 focuses on stewardship aspects, and it specifies the items or concepts to be considered. Again, so that means they're not required to be included, 
but they do need to be considered. It also requires documented information as evidence and communication as relevant. Regarding compliance obligations, the section is again shortened with no significant changes um, to report. 6.1.3.1 covers international waste trade agreements and national laws. This is shortened. It requires MOCs, uh, materials of concern, be treated as hazardous waste. And it requires that the East Steward Organization adhere to the Basel Conventions Article 4.4a, uh, which is the Basel ban, even if their country has not ratified it. So this is important um, for those of us in the US, for example. 6.1.3.2 is a new section regarding extended producer responsibility programs. Uh, take a look at that term in the definition section to become more familiar with this concept if you are not already or to assess whether this applies to your organization or not. It requires documented information um, specifically for organizations participating in these EPR programs to be made available, available upon request. 6.1.4 covers performance verification which, uh, as I recall, is a new section in the standard. I think it was moved from the appendices or um, sanctioned interpretation into the body of the standard here. Um, and it requires a documented plan for unannounced performance verification program inspections conducted by e-stewards and specifies uh, certain items that need to be included within that plan. So take a look at section 6.1.4 as you develop that plan if you have not already done so. Six point one point four point one covers reporting to eStewards database. This relates to the reporting of all electronic equipment under the organization's control. And you can take a look at the definition of control. Um, and this will be uploaded to the East Stewards website in English, and further detail can be found in Appendix A. This requires an initial report prior to certification, documenting the period between contracting with a certification body all the way through passing their, the stage one audit, which should be at least three months worth of uh, data, and then by January 31st of each year reporting on the previous year. So this is an annual reporting requirement in addition to that initial report. 6.2 focuses on objectives. This is shortened uh, with the removal of 14,001 verbiage and there are no significant changes to the intent of these requirements. 6.3 is a new section covering planning for change. It relates to planning and implementing action where appropriate regarding significant changes to the SMS. 6.4 covers contingency planning, and this specifies uh, information should be documented within the contingency planning evidence. Um, things like the names and contact information for the third party holding the organization's financial instrument, as well as for the third party with authority to access the site closure funds. So there are some changes uh, here regarding contingency planning you'll want to familiarize yourself with. There are no significant changes regarding planning for site closure still requires a site and inventory description, closure costs, schedule of activities, uh, third-party testing if applicable, things like that. 6.4.2 covers the financial surety concept for, a secure, uh, for the closure plan. Um, changes here, worth noting, uh, they've removed the option for a corporate parent to hold a financial instrument. And this section for the financial surety, there is listed an exemption from this requirement 
if the e-stewards organization's cleanup or closure costs total less than 5,000 US dollars, and evidence of this would be required. So if the closure costs are less than 5,000 US dollars, then you would not need a financial instrument. There are no significant changes regarding insurance. Um, this section did remove the qualification specifications for the insurance professional or underwriter. There are also no significant changes regarding resources in 7.1. 7.2 uh, focused on competence has been shortened with no significant changes to the intent. So between version 4.0 and ISO 14001, the requirements have not really changed. Similarly, 7.3 regarding awareness, there's no significant changes. Um, 7.4 focuses on communication no changes to the overall intent here. Regarding internal communication, you're required to have a communication process free of fear of reprisal when it comes to the relevant SMS information, objectives, operational controls, uh, relevant changes, and industrial hygiene monitoring results. Regarding external communication, version 4.0 requires communication of relevant controls, emergency response protocols, and security requirements with contractors and visitors. It also specifies information to be confidentially communicated to upstream customers and the eStewards program administrator. I've included a couple examples on this slide, but you'll definitely want to check out 7.4.3 to make sure that all the relevant information is being communicated as required, the East Stewards Program Administrator and to upstream customers. Regarding documented information, the general section is shortened. It allows for organizations to determine whether they want to combine the documentation requirements within the standard or separate them out. Um, it's really a matter of preference unless otherwise specified in the standard. There are a couple exceptions um, a couple times in the standard where it's required to be separated, and those include the closure plan, the emergency preparedness and response plan, and the downstream disposition chart. And the justification that eStewards provides for that requirement is that those are really important documents within the standard and should be very easily accessible. If they are combined within other things, that might not necessarily be the case. So those documents are to be um, separated and maintained as individual documents. All of the rest of the documentation requirements in the standard, it's up to the organization how they would like to maintain those. 7.5.2, again, nothing earth shattering here regarding creating and updating documented information. Uh, it's shortened and really gives um, some flexibility. This is covered in 14,001 as well. So it just requires the documentation of changes and revision status as applicable. It does specify under 7.5.3 control of documented information that standard required records would be maintained for at least five years. One exception to that would be worker exposure records, which are um, a regulatory requirement to maintain for the length of employment plus 30 years. Section 8 covers operation, 8.1 specifically operational planning and control. This section is shortened. The hierarchy of controls is to be utilized where applicable, and that is listed out within uh, section 8.1 if you're not already familiar with the hierarchy of controls. 8.2 focuses on emergency preparedness and response. This is again shorter, no changes to the intent, 
it does require annual drills for relevant types of emergencies. So if you weren't already doing um, at least one annual drill, then you'll need to um, change that frequency in your system. 8.3 covers industrial hygiene uh, program expectations. Sorry about that. Uh, the program is required to address hazards of uh, an airborne ergonomic noise and physical nature. It also requires prevention of hazard migration to other areas. Eight point one eight, excuse me, eight point three point one covers PHPTs, which is potentially hazardous processing technologies. So this section specifies additional inclusions to the industrial hygiene program for organizations using at least one PHPT. Obviously, you can find out what would qualify as a PHPT within the standard. And then if you are utilizing one or more PHPT, then these requirements would kick in. This is not an all-inclusive list. You would wanna look at the standard for the full requirement. Um, there are testing and monitoring protocols, specification of a requirement to use a certified industrial hygienist or equivalent, the use of a 17025 lab, um, noise monitoring, let's see initial industrial hygiene testing in specified areas prior to the stage one, and then again about a year later. The retesting uh, frequency is specified. The results have to be evaluated by a cert uh, certified industrial hygienist or equivalent and or a knowledgeable physician, taking appropriate or recommended actions that they may chair. Um, there is the addition of biological monitoring in certain circumstances, a medical surveillance program, program in certain circumstances, and an agreement with a designated health provider. So these are a couple of the uh, changes, but obviously this is a pretty long and specific list. So take a look at 8.3.1 if this requirement applies to your organization. 8.4 covers the responsible management of electronic equipment. 8.4.1, planning of management of electronic equipment. This specifies topics or information to be determined and planned by the organization, and it requires enough documented information to serve as evidence of both determination of those requirements and implementation of the plan. 8.4.2 covers processing, controls, and restrictions. This includes requirements for operational controls for the processing of electronic equipment, including materials of concern. There is a table within the section, Table 2, uh, items restricted for mechanical processing. There are no changes here um, between 3.1 and version 4.0. The contents of the table are the same as the uh, equivalent table in 3.1. And the only exception to this restriction is if the organization is using some type of closed system technology for processing those materials. Overall, 8.4.2 is less prescriptive and there are no significant changes to the intent of the requirements. Section 8.4.3 covers packaging, storage, and transportation. It specifies requirements for controls for the electronic equipment under its control. Again, this is a specific term. It's capitalized throughout the presentation and the standard. You want to familiarize yourself with that term and definition to make sure you're not missing anything that's relevant. It includes specifications such as not storing materials of concern for more than one year. Uh, in most cases, requiring uh, vehicle and driver safety records um, within the transporter criteria that is a, in addition to what was already required in uh, version 3.1. They have instituted stacking limits. 
um, and several other changes. 8.4.4 is the new section focusing on tolling operations. It regulates the tolling process, including expectations for communication, uh, contract stipulations, um, the requirement to annul a tolling contract if violations are identified, and things like that. Uh, so that is uh, section 8.4.4. If tolling operations apply to you, take a close look at that section. Documented information is required as evidence. 8.4.5 covers prison operations. In general, this is not permitted, um, but there are some exceptions. If you meet specified criteria in section 8.4.5 and obtain written approval from the eStewards program administrator. 8.5 is reuse refurbishment of electronic equipment. No changes to the intent here. The section does prohibit the sale or transfer or donation of non-sanitized electronic equipment unless it's going to a NAID AAA certified IDP. Exceptions to that would be tolling operations or instances where the non-sanitized equipment is sent back to its original owner. The section also requires that refurbishment or repair shipments only be outsourced to IDPs, um, except for ink and toner remanufacturing, which can go one tier further. So material destined for refurbishment and or repair can only go one tier. So it would be going to that IDP and no further, again, unless it's going for ink and toner remanufacturing. Items for direct reuse must be found fully functional. Again, these are um, terms that you can find defini definitions for in version 4.0. And the exception to this would be shipments to the IDP for refurbishment and or repair. Eight point five point one covers test electronic equipment and ensure full functionality and data sanitization. No significant changes to the intent here. Um, as always, it specifies testing requirements. There are some changes in this section, um, such as to the battery testing criteria, but overall the intent is certainly the same. Um, there are some exceptions to full functionality testing, which can be found in table three. Um, the only uh, noteworthy changes here would be uh, the donation or sales of unusual equipment is capped at 1% of the annual total units sold and donated. There is also a removal of uh, a row in the previous version of the table, which housed untested units sold or donated to workers. So that is not found in version 4.0. 8.5.2 covers uh, recording of identifying information for each item of electronic equipment. This specifies the identification criteria and inclusions. You can find more detail in 8.5.2. And as I mentioned earlier, version 4.0 simplifies the inventory requirements for QSCs, such as allowing the organization to put the um, QSCs to organize them into lots instead of labeling or identifying each individual item. And QSC is a specific term with its own definition. Um, it's not for the organization to determine what is a QSC, but to follow the definition supplied by version 4. Eight point five point two point one covers shipping document documentation. It specifies the minimum amount of information. Excuse me. Specifies the minimum amount of information to be recorded for all sales or transfers. Um, this is to be made accessible without the need for unpacking. Appendix A, um, eight point eight point seven includes the declaration. You're to use the specific declaration or an equivalent 
for applicable transboundary shipments. That's not really new. Um, that was in 3.1 as well. And it requires accessibility and availability of identifying information for all shipments other than QSCs. Um, examples might include an itemized packing list. 8.5.3 requires the verification of a direct reuse market. This is shorter, less prescriptive, um, no significant changes. However, it does require that um, the organization have evidence to prove shipments were fully functional and sold for at least three times the scrap rate. If this is maintained, the specific buyer information is not required. So this is an exception to the requirement to um, uh, maintain buyer information that was found in 3.1. I apologize if I'm moving through this quickly. There's a lot of information. It's a lengthy <laughs> standard um, and I wanna allow for a time for questions as well. So I'm gonna keep moving uh, pretty quickly. 8.6 covers restrictions on materials, recovery, and final disposition. Um, 8.6.1 specifies management criteria for MOCs, and more detail can be found in Appendix A 8.6.1. It does require written proof and justification, um, meeting specific criteria in 8.6.1 be provided to both the certification body and the e-stewards program administrator before the organization uses the conditionally allowable option. 8.6.2 focuses on alter alternative uses, excuse me, and it does specify that <clears throat> certain items need to be included in the approval request um, and there are other documentation requirements. So if you are pursuing the use of an alternative use, check out 8.6.2. It does require written approval from the e-stewards program administrator. It will also require downstream due diligence be performed for utilizing the alternative process or use. 8.7 covers control of transboundary movement. Whole electronic equipment is to be treated as HEW unless the shipment provides documented evidence proving otherwise. E-Stewards is really big on its terms and definitions, so take a look at electronic equipment, HEW, to make sure um, you have your equipment properly identified and categorized. It also requires written notification and competent authority consent prior to transboundary movement of MOCs. When uh, countries are involved that are not Basel, Basel Convention parties or covered by relevant multilateral trade agreements. Again, this is going to be relevant for the US. 8.7.1 constitutes exemptions from transboundary movement controls for MOCs. Um, so this section 8.7.1 lists exemptions to 8.7. Uh, new parts would be an exemption uh, if they've been purchased under warranty or for repair. Uh, another example would be clean CRT cullet um, going for uh, to serve as feedstock. Um, it specifies those exemptions in 8.7.1. 8.7.2 um, specifies labeling and declaration requirements uh, to meet 8.5.2.1 and also references Appendix A. For any electronic equipment or components uh, exported to IDPs for refurbishment or repair. So if you are exporting items for refurbishment or repair to that IDP, take a look at the labeling um, requirements that are applicable. Similarly, if the electronic equipment is being exported for direct reuse, 8.7.3, excuse me, specifies that it must be fully functional and not recycled or finally disposed. So for example, it needs an established resale market to prove that it is um, not going to be recycled. Again, there are labeling and declaration requirements um, to be met 
uh, to meet 8.5.2.1, and again, we're seeing a reference to Appendix A. Downstream accountability uh, 8.8 .8 adds a requirement to reevaluate a downstream processor upon any significant changes within a timely manner. That would be the only um, real change worth noting here between 3.1 and version 4. Everything else has mostly stayed the same. Um, it's worth noting also that this section applies even if the electronic equipment is shipped directly to the IDP from the customer's site um, instead of first going to the e-steward organization itself. Um, it's still uh, covered by that control definition. So make sure you are not skipping any tiers or um, processors in your downstream accountability. No significant changes to the downstream disposition chart requirements either found in 8.8.1. Um, it is worth noting, however, that an organization certified to e-stewards cannot utilize any downstream processor within their recycling chain that has lost their e-steward certificate in response to a critical nonconformity until or unless the certificate is reinstated. So part of the downstream accountability or due diligence is, um, involves making sure that their e-steward certificate is valid. And if you find that it's not, they cannot be used until that certificate is reinstated. If it's not reinstated or it's not um, going to be timely enough, you'll need to identify another downstream um, processor. 8.8.2 covers downstream due diligence and it requires that the organization attain support documentation and approval of all downstream providers and intermediaries within the entire recycling chain to meet the requirements within 8.8.2. So that might not necessarily be a change, but as always, it's important to make sure you have everyone accounted for. Specifically, those subsections of 8.8.2 cover processing capability evaluations, um, this is an, an initial uh, review prior to shipping um, to them for the first time and then on an annual basis after that. Additional criteria are added for downstream processors who are not certified to e-stewards. Desktop audits are also required initially prior to shipment and then subsequently on an annual basis. The exception to that would be final disposal facilities. On-site audits of immediate downstream processors are not required if the IDP is e-steward certified or if they are a final disposal facility or an end processor. The end processor does need to be licensed and permitted as well as located in an OECD country. So some nuances there. But on the bright side, the uh, requirement to repeat those on-site audits has been relaxed from every two years in 3.1 to every three years. So you have to go on-site for those IDPs initially prior to that first shipment, conduct your on-site audit, but then um, you only have to do them every three years. You also have to repeat those assessments upon significant change. And again, that's a defined term. 8.8.2.3 now includes a review of closure plans and financial surety for the IDP and for their recycling chain. So those were not previously included. 8.8.2.4 covers agreements and control systems. This requires a written contract or agreement or some type of equivalent control with specified um, items to be included so that um, certain information is relayed. And the exceptions to that would be an e-steward certified uh, IDP, a final disposal facility, or an end processor. So for any IDPs receiving HEWs or PCMs, a written contract agreement or equivalent is required to meet 8.8.2.4. 
unless they're a steward certified, a final disposal facility, or an end processor. This section further requires each DP, downstream processor, beyond the IDP, to implement and meet these same requirements, 8.8.2.4b, throughout the recycling chain. So they have to implement that um, through the rest of the recycling chain as well. Hope you're enjoying all these tongue twisters over all these sub clauses. 8.8.2.5 covers ATW transportation companies. There are no significant changes here. Next subsection covers records of transfer. It specifies the shipping record retention requirements as well as annual sampling of shipments between each IDP and the next non e stewards downstream processor tier. Eight point nine covers data security. This section doesn't really have any contents. It references Appendix D, um, and this applies for organizations who are not yet certified to NAID AAA. Again, as a reminder, this is required by eStewards version 4.0 by July 1st of 2022. Until you obtain NAID certification, NAID AAA certification, excuse me, it's a specific type. Um, Appendix D requirements for data security apply and will be audited by the certification body. After NAID AAA certification is obtained, or by this deadline, if you haven't achieved it, you would lose your eStewards certification. Whichever occurs sooner, Appendix D will no longer be applied and audited. So the NAID AAA certification will satisfy the data security requirements of eStewards in place of Appendix D once that certification is obtained. Getting into Section 9, Performance Evaluation, again, we see a lot of sections shortened with the 14,001 verbiage removed. Um, again, assuming you're going to be meeting those requirements in 14,001. So regarding monitoring and measurement, analysis, and evaluation, this is much shorter, less prescriptive, and overall no changes to the intent. The only change regarding evaluations of compliance worth noting would be that the minimum frequency is identified as annual compliance evaluations. No significant changes regarding facility inspection requirements. Um, the only change regarding electronic equipment flow monitoring worth noting is a um, note about the final discrepancy. So the final discrepancy itself is not changed. The material balance accounting um, discrepancy should not be more than 5%. However, version 4.0 specifies that if it is higher than 5%, corrective action is required. No significant changes regarding internal audits. No significant changes regarding management review. Again, this continues to specify the required inputs. There might be some slight changes um, to those inputs. Uh, recording of any actions um, that result from that management review and the maintenance of documented information as evidence. Clause 10 covers improvement and similarly, this is shorter, less prescriptive with no significant changes. I apologize for the length of today's webinar. We are going to go over by a couple of minutes. Hopefully, you can bear with me. The uh, end of the standard includes appendices, and we'll briefly highlight the four appendices and their contents, and then close with um, the certification process overview and questions. The information is in the slides, so I'm going to move through these very quickly. Uh, you can reference them as needed. Appendix A covers specific details and criteria for implementation in addition to what is found in the body of the standard. And in several spots, you see this appendix referenced um, annual database reporting to eStewards, for example, or the PHPT hazard testing requirements table um, and the transboundary shipment declarations. Those can be found within Appendix A. Appendix B includes administrative criteria for the eSteward organization, things like eligibility details, 
um, certification scope requirements related to ancillary sites, parent companies, multi-sites, things like that, um, that may or may not be relevant to all of your organizations. Uh, logo usage, uh, performance verification inspections that eStewards performs, things like that. Two things worth noting here, uh, Appendix B requires a new license agreement if the organization is purchased by another company or entity, or if there is a similar change in ownership. So something to keep in mind. It also requires that the certified organization notify their certification body and the eStewards program administrator of any significant changes affecting conformity within 15 business days. So that's an important communication requirement specified by version 4.0. Appendix C focuses on administrative criteria for certification bodies such as PJR or accreditation bodies um, such as ANAB. So I'm not going to go into any detail on that section beyond the fact that Appendix C specifies the audit time calculation information for the certification bodies to follow. So what that means is we don't create our own audit time uh, day calculations. This is something that is mandated by the standard itself. By removing ISO 14001 um, and requiring a separate ISO 14001 certification, Appendix C requires audit time be calculated uh, separately for ISO 14001 uh, 14, and eStewards version 4.0. By calculating them separately and requiring um, Appendix C requiring them to be calculated identically, um, this will cause an overall increase in audit time. So I wanted to give all our clients a heads up about that. Appendix D, the final appendix, again covers data security. We talked about this earlier. All of the requirements in Appendix D, such as um, communication of data security risks, um, identification of security processes, methods of sanitization, things like that, are specified in Appendix D and relevant um, to the management system until or unless the organization achieves NAID AAA certification instead. Once you have NAID AAA certification, your certification body will not be auditing you to Appendix D. It would satisfy those data security requirements. Whew. Okay, so really briefly for anyone who is pursuing certification for the first time, instead of transitioning from version 3.1 to 4, the first step would be obtaining a, a copy of the standard. And again, that can be accessed for free from eStewards website. You'll then want to establish your SMS documentation to meet the requirements found within the standard. You will need to conduct the training that's required, implement the requirements of the standard, including conducting an internal audit, conducting a compliance evaluation, and conducting a management review of the system, which should occur after the internal audit. You'll need to, con uh, to have a contract with a certification body, such as Perry Johnson Registrars. And then you will complete stage one and stage two audits, address any resulting nonconformities, and ultimately be issued a certificate. So really briefly, what we mean by the stage one audit is a, a documentation review of the SMS to ensure your readiness for the stage two audit. The stage two audit, on the other hand, is an audit of the entire management system. All of the processes and all of the shifts would be sampled in this case um, to get a full picture of the management system's implementation and effectiveness in meeting the requirements of eStewards version 4.0. Uh, at the stage two level, you may be um, issued nonconformities in areas where uh, the system deviates from the standard requirements or has not been effectively implemented. Those would need to be resolved through the corrective action process before a certificate could be issued. You don't get nonconformities at a stage one. After a certificate is issued, the certificate is good for three years. So you're on a three-year surveillance cycle. Those first two years of the cycle 
are um, considered the surveillance audits, they would be annual or semi-annual based on your preference and your contract. Those would be partial system audits. Not all of the processes would be sampled. It would be roughly half during each of those surveillance audits. Um, the third year of the cycle constitutes the recertification audit, which for all intensive purposes is exactly like the stage two audit. It's a full system audit and results in a new certificate after any nonconformities are addressed. Okay, I went through the information very quickly. Um, please type in any questions you have if you haven't already done so. And in the meantime, I'm going to put our contact information up on the screen in case you have any technical information or are re-watching this recording because I went over and you couldn't hang um, through to the end. So again, my name is Austin Matthews. Um, I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. I can be reached via email or the main PJR number, as can our EHS Program Manager, Stacey DeSantis, um, and her email is listed as well. If you are a new client looking for a quote, I've also included the information for our sales department. So let's see if we have any questions. I actually don't see any questions at this time. I can hang out for another minute or two in case someone is still typing. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I, I appreciate you hanging in there for a couple extra minutes. Um, feel free to reference the recording and the slides. Uh, if you find you have questions once you're reviewing it in more detail, I can also be contacted. Um, again, this is just a um, educational overview webinar, not a formal training to the standard to conduct internal audits or anything like that, but we're happy to help um, if we can if we can help with your transition, um, answer any questions you might have as you prepare to transition to version 4.0. If you have an audit coming up in August and you'll be transitioning sooner rather than later, good luck with your transition. I hope this webinar is helpful. Um, and otherwise, good luck in preparing your system to uh, reflect version 4.0. I hope you find it easier to um, navigate than version 3.1. I still don't see any questions, so I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much for joining me today, and good luck with your transition.